Good afternoon. I want you to imagine, please, what it must be like to hug a polar bear. Just, just go there for a minute. Just think about that. Now, I may have moved your mindset to a place instantly of pure, unadulterated fear. Or perhaps you see it as a challenge here at Warwick. But if you do see it as a challenge, come and see me afterwards. Either way, the immense power and strength of a polar bear is indeed indisputable. Their lives are all about survival. They're territorial in nature. They are great communicators. And do you know what? There are behavioral comparisons between humans and polar bears, not just in how we connect and interact with one another, but also in how we express ourselves through, for example, the emotions of gratitude, sympathy, joy, and love. And these emotions are absolutely fundamental, I think, to our interactions as human beings. But they can also, for example, be observed in the way that a polar bear looks after its baby cub, especially in extreme cold. So, maybe, just maybe, it isn't so different, so scary to be seen to be hugging a polar bear after all. Never diminish the power of a hug. Something that as human beings, we all need in not just giving them, but also receiving them. So consider for a moment how you would feel if you couldn't express the emotion of gratitude, sympathy, joy, or love through a hug. How would that be for you? Let me share with you a little story about a young teenager who at the age of 15 dreamt of becoming the general manager of the Savoy Hotel in London. I'm deadly serious. And I was finally diagnosed with the progressive muscle wasting disease known as muscular dystrophy, my crossroads moment, if you like. And my dream career was no longer viable. I knew deep down that despite a few years later being offered a place on the esteemed Savoy Training Management Scheme, the industry that I still love very much to this day was not going to become a reality because of my castaway moment, my crossroads moment. And I blamed anyone that would listen to me, including the good Lord up above. I blamed my mother, who was the carrier of a, of a mutant gene which was responsible for my muscular dystrophy. And I want you to imagine just for a moment when you were a child, perhaps when things weren't quite going the way that you had hoped they would. Perhaps on occasion you were afraid. Perhaps you were anxious about stuff. Maybe you even stomped your feet in frustration. Do you remember such a time? Are you there? And so, in being fully present with me in this moment in time, perhaps a TEDx first, maybe a first here at the University of Warwick, I'd like to invite everyone in this auditorium for just a moment to stomp your feet. Go. And now, give yourselves a huge round of applause. And like you did just now, do you know what? I wanted to really, really, really stomp my feet when I received that diagnosis of muscular dystrophy. And that was a difficult reality for me to process. But I couldn't because my leg muscles were too weak. Stomping for Michael was out. And I felt hugely, hugely frustrated. And even though I couldn't physically express my anger, even though I felt fearful for my future, even though I felt like this, I recognized that I was not alone. When Archbishop Desmond Tutu was discussing with His Holiness the Dalai Lama the subjects of fear, stress, 
and anxiety. In this wonderful book, The Book of Joy, the archbishop was quoted as saying, fear and anxiety are mechanisms that have helped us to survive. So whether you have a disability that's visible or invisible, my experience of, fear, of feeling fearful, of feeling anxious about the future, are emotions that perhaps even the one billion people with a disability in our world today have experienced too. Muscular dystrophy affects one in 100,000 people worldwide. There's no cure, there's no treatment. It is a cruel, unforgiving, relentless disease, believe me. And despite the doubts, the anxieties, the inherent fears that were emerging uh, deep within me, I went to work, engaged in the world of work, and over several years I started to become a little disillusioned with the corporate mindset, the world of work. I was becoming disillusioned with it. And I felt that there was something deep within me that needed to be explored, something that needed to be understood and brought out and unearthed. And in late 2001, I came across an article in the FT, that's the Financial Times, not that I'd read that every day, about a chap who was planning an expedition to go to the North Pole to raise money and awareness for muscular dystrophy. And I reached out and I contacted him to see how I could add further gravitas to his endeavor. Today, in part as a result of being differently abled, when I meet people for the very first time, irrespective of our belief systems, irrespective of our cultural differences, I try very hard to meet them on what the Dalai Lama refers to as a human-to-human -human level. And the long and short of it is this, that after reaching an agreement that I could join his North Pole expedition, I recruited my own team, got the operating costs secured, and some months later, we were off. And in April 2002, on the Arctic ice cap, I was literally lifted down the icy steps of a Russian Sikorsky uh, helicopter. And then arm in arm, I slowly, slowly walked, assisted to the little flag that you see here in this next slide, planted at 90 degrees north on top of our world. The 150-meter walk took me just over half an hour. The walk symbolically represented those with muscular dystrophy in this country. And the media played its part in telling the story and raising more awareness about MD. And whilst at the pole, with the help of one of my expedition team members, who later became my angel investor, who believed in me, proposed that we plan our own standalone expedition, this time to Antarctica and the South Pole. So you see, what goes up must go down. So do you know that we all have people that we look up to, don't we? People that we admire, legends, heroes. And for me, one of my heroes is the great Irish polar explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton, widely known as one of the greatest leaders on earth bar none. And his name lives on as a synonym for courage, bravery, and most of all, leadership. And his story of extraordinary survival over a hundred years ago and his compelling leadership decisions offer many lessons for the business challenges of today's world. And I was honored, truly, truly honored, to have Ernest Shackleton's only granddaughter, Alexandra Shackleton here, agree to be a patron for my South Pole uh, expedition. And in adopting the Shackletonian principles of leadership and recruitment, maybe for another day, I assimilated my, my team for what became known as our pole-to-pole -pole expedition. And our journey uh, began for real on arrival at Patriot Hills, the name given to the base camp in Antarctica. 
And the final stage of, of our journey involved my being manhauled or sledge hauled, as you can see here, the last few kilometers or so to within a short distance, some 310 meters of the South Pole. And once again, I was physically lifted up from the supine position into the vertical position and slowly, slowly, one step at a time, I began to walk the final 310 meters. This time, each meter representing people with muscular dystrophy in our world today. Mission accomplished. Both expeditions were made possible because of the supportive arms that assisted me in those last few moments, as well as along the way. And in the end, it was me stretching my arms out as best as I could in the freezing cold of the South Pole to express my gratitude to my team. Never diminish the power of a hug. And in reaching the South Pole, I made a little history of my own by becoming the first disabled person to have successfully reached both poles. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking to yourself, what on earth what on earth is this all about? Why would someone with muscular dystrophy who feels the cold want to go to two of the most extreme, inaccessible, undesirable places on earth? Of course, there were, there were risks. People with muscular dystrophy often feel the cold, particularly in their extremities, their feet and toes, their hands and their fingers. I can't shiver. I can't retain my body heat like polar bears with their thick furs and layers of fat. I wanted to see and explore my own inner self, if you like, an exploration, a journey of discovery in learning more about my strengths and my weaknesses and my vulnerabilities. An opportunity, if you like, to, uh, to test my mental resilience and in the process, identify coping strategies, str coping mechanisms to help support me for the remaining days. And I wanted to challenge the, the naysayers, the merchants of doom, who said, Michael, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I remember my father who said to me, son, you're off your bloody rocker. Love you, dad. But you know, it wasn't impossible, it just hadn't been done before by someone like me, and I would suggest that in most cases, in most cases, the only barriers are those that you choose to accept. Today, my disability has become a passport in enabling me to engage hearts and minds of audiences, engage people emotionally and intellectually, to helpfully, hopefully inspire others uh, to unlock their own potential to defy their own odds. Today, uh, it's my absolute belief that as human beings, our humanity is defined by our vulnerabilities, by our weaknesses. That's why we all need one another. That's why we all need to be loved. And that's why we all need to be hugged from time to time, whether you have a disability or not. Ever the optimist, much of this, I think, is about having a singular focus, having great support systems around you. And I'm reminded by the words of Ernest Shackleton, who said, optimism is true moral courage. And with the power of the, the polar hug theme in mind, I was at my most vulnerable in these extreme environments, and I had to rely 100% on those around me to simply survive. From zipping up my sleeping bag to putting on my polar boots and lacing them up, my survival depended on the support of others. And in defying convention, Ernest Shackleton once listed the, uh, the qualities he looked for in a polar explorer as follows. Optimism, patience, imagination coupled with idealism, and courage. 
Having returned home in February 2004, Alexandra Shackleton sent me a lovely note and referring to her grandfather's key attributes, saying that I reminded her of her grandpa. Being considered by Shackleton's granddaughter as someone possessing um, similar traits to her grandfather was not only deeply humbling, but it also reminded me of the point that I made a little earlier about our humanity being defined by our vulnerabilities, something that to this day I'm still learning about. But I can tell you this, the need to be loved is imperative. It's vital for all of us, especially in a world that's all about immediacy. I need it now. I want it now. The fast-paced, technologically driven world that we live in today. A world where I think is that as human beings, we need to exercise a little more compassion, a little more kindness, and where the occasional hug can be an immensely powerful thing. For me, the essence of why it is people have, for example, the ability to do extraordinary things, why some people defy expectations, defy stereotypes, defy biases, can redefine the impossible, is, I believe, the ability to have that singular focus, that self-belief, that resilience, an instinct perhaps underpinned by a little humility and warmth that radiates out like a crackling log fire. Six weeks ago to the day, it was National Hug Day, a celebration that is observed all around the world, National Hug Day. And the aim is simple, to encourage the planet to simply hug family and friends a little more often. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all have a, a big group hug or go and find a polar bear to go and have a hug with. The point is this. Earlier, you accepted my invitation. You did something that I, that I used to be able to do but can no longer do. You stomped your feet. And for that, I'm grateful. But today, in this moment, I've chosen to share a vulnerability within me that's arisen over the last number of years as a result of the slow, deteriorative, muscle-wasting condition that is slowly destroying my life. And that is simply this, that I need help now to give a hug. I need help in wrapping my arms around my daughter. I need help in wrapping my arms around my wife. I need help in wrapping my arms around my favorite son-in-law. It's an in-family joke. <laughs> Never diminish the power of a hug. Your ability to use all of your hugging muscles to give joy, to give gratitude, to give empathy, to give love, it's a powerful gift. Dare to defy is, I believe, neatly summed up by a message that I received from my mum in Antarctica all those years ago. And I've chosen to share this message with you as we close. We have been made what we are. You are unique. There will never be another you. You were created for a purpose that only you can fulfill. So never give up for being who you are. Look at the opportunities before you, not the limitations. Thank you.